This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the book of Ezekiel. This is session number six, Signs About Exile from Jerusalem, Message About Prophecy, Pre-Fall and Post-Fall, Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 1 through chapter 14, verse 11. We have come now in our lectures to chapter 12. And I remind you that we are in the second part of the book of Ezekiel. And that second part began in chapter 8 with a report of visions begun with the historical dating. And that, of course, was the same pattern that we found at the beginning of the book. And the parallel continues because in the first part of the book, we went on to symbolic actions. And so we're going to do so now. The parallelism continues, this parallel structuring. And in 12, 1 to 20, we have symbolic actions that Ezekiel is told to do, just as he was in the first part of the book. There are two symbolic actions, and the first is in verses 1 through 16, and the second is in verses 17 to 20. And each one is prefaced with a, a notice about receiving a message. And so this separates the two parts. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me. Verse 17, the word of the Lord came to me. And so the two symbolic actions are differentiated in that way with their commentary. And like the earlier symbolic actions, they help to predict the future. And they're another way. We said actions speak louder than words. And so here, too, we find this show-and-tell attitude uh, that there's a, first a symbolic action and then the explanation of it. And so they help to dis predict disaster for these uh, exiles of 597, and they destroy the false hopes that these prisoners of war had. Those prisoners of war kept their spirits up. They encouraged themselves. It won't last long. The tide's going to turn before very long, and uh, we'll be going back once again into the land. And as we've said before, Ezekiel has to keep on crying, no, 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 in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is through symbolic actions. Jeremiah, you may remember, uh, wrote a letter to those uh, 597 exiles in chapter 29 of, of his book and told them, Haha, you expect to come back soon, but uh, it's not going to happen. And he gave the uh, round figure of 70 years, and uh, that round figure was, was pretty spot on. Uh, it, it was uh, 538 before the first party of exiles started coming back to uh, Judah. And so Ezekiel has a very similar message. It ain't going to happen soon. But he also has the message that it's eventually going to happen, just as Jeremiah did. 1 to 16, the account of the first symbolic action falls into the three typical subsections. God's directions to Ezekiel to perform it, in 2 to 6, Ezekiel's performance in verse 7, and the interpretation to pass on to the prisoners of war on the next day in verses 8 to 16. And so the whole communication spreads over two days in this case. Verses 2 and 3 are an introduction to the uh, symbolism. Mortal, you are living in the midst of a rebellious house. Oh, we've had that often before, haven't we? And here it is again, this characteristic uh, description, the rebellious community of these uh, exiles. And here we're told they have eyes to see but do not see, ears to hear but do not hear, for they are rebell a rebellious house. And this description is one that we've seen before. Uh, if, if we know our, our prophets, we've read it before. Uh, 
Isaiah, in his uh, call to become a prophet, he was told very something very similar. Uh, in verse 9 of Isaiah 6, God said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. And Isaiah is told, Make the mind of this people dull, and stop their ears and shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears. In that case, God... God, through Isaiah, was, was going to expose their antipathy to God by their very rejection of Isaiah's message, which would put even more blame on the exiles and their even more liability to punishment from God. But more directly, Ezekiel perhaps knew of Isaiah 6. I don't know why he shouldn't. But more directly, this is a, a reminiscence of a verse in Jeremiah which um, Ezekiel may well have heard uh, Jeremiah saying back in pre-exilic days. Jeremiah 5 and verse 21. Uh, Jeremiah is told to say, Hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. And this is what's being picked up and what's being uh, in, in, enlarged, in, 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 in fact, uh, uh, here in, the, in, in this description here, uh, with this qualification that very much belongs to Ezekiel, they are a rebellious house. And you're moving on to, to therefore in verse 3. And uh, there's a little reminiscence, a little side glance, at the format of an oracle of judgment, which begins with accusation, and the accusation comes in the rebellious house, and then it moves on to, to judgment, the punishment that's to come. And very often there's a telltale sign of the linking between the two, the word therefore, the logical progression from accusation to punishment. And this is what we've got, even with the symbolic action. And so... Uh, the symbolic action is going to indicate punishment after accusation. They are rebellious house, therefore conduct this symbolic action. And uh, it's quite a, quite a complicated one. Uh, Ezekiel is to pretend he's back in Jerusalem. And he's to pretend that he's been told he's got to prepare for exile, to go to, to, to Babylon. And um, this, of course, the purpose of this symbolic action is to forecast 587 and that general deportation of, of, of the people then. But it, it must have filled Ezekiel with a sense of deja vu because this was the very sort of thing he'd done in 597 a few years before, uh, five years but before. He, he'd known that uh, long trek on the road to exile and the preparations. What was he going to take with him? What should he take? Sorting through his belongings. Not much, enough to put in a sack, not too heavy to carry on my back. And so he's to reenact this, but now with 587 in mind and the exile following 587. And so prepare for yourself in exile's baggage and go into exile by day in their sight. And people are to be looking on. Essentially, there's to be an audience and these, of course, are the 597 exiles who are away in, in, in Babylonia. You should go like an exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps this is a, a wistful thought on God's part. It's said with a sigh. Perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. The truth is told them. Whether it's going to sink in, we don't know. And uh, God fears not, but... It might, it might. We'll, we'll see how it goes. And so what, what seems to be happening, it, it's quite complicated that um, the first part of the symbolic action uh, happens within Ezekiel's home uh, as, as an exile away in Babylon. And he's to sort through his things. He's to have his exile sack. He's to sort through what sort of things would I take into exile. And he's thinking what he took last time. And uh, perhaps it's the same things he's putting back into the sack again. Perhaps it's the same sack that he carried on that long journey to Babylon. And uh, he, he sorts it out. And he's to put that bag 
outside the door and leave it there. And uh, the, the people would, would say, what, what, what's he doing? What's this sack? Oh, he's gone indoors again. Let's have a look. And they'd poke in this sack. With, what is this? What's this? Oh, he, he's, he's got his, his choice possessions. Yeah. What's he doing there? They could get stolen. Hope they don't get stolen. And so he's, he's got the attention. What's the sack doing outside exile, the Ezekiel's house in exile? And, um, and also he's to dig through the wall. Another part of the exile, he's to dig through the wall. And what on earth does this mean? This is going to be explained. It's another part of the symbolic action, this making a hole in the wall. In Babylonia, houses were made of uh, adobe brick, and, and you, could, um, you could damage them and uh, make openings in, in them quite easily. But this is another part of the symbolic action, this hole in the wall that he's got to make. And what on earth does it mean? Well, we shall find out eventually. But he's make a, a hole enough to, to carry out his sack through it and leave, leave it uh, outside. But, but then... Uh, after that, he's, at twilight in the evening, he, he used to go out uh, and pick up his sack with his sack on his back and set off uh, away from where his audience is. And as he goes, he's got to cover his face and he can't bear to look one last lingering look at his home with all his memories. And so very much a sort of an exilic reaction uh, of somebody who's going to exile, you can't bear to look. I remember when it, when I've when I've left home and gone off in a taxi, I won't look round at the old house. It's gone. It's gone. I've got to look forward. I've got to look forward. And so, close your eyes. Don't look at the old house. And in verse six, he's told you're a sign for the house of Israel. This is uh, something that's relevant for the future exile in 587. And so that was what he did. That was what he did. And he digs through the hole and um, carries off his, his sack that he's, he's prepared. And then comes the interpretation next morning. He's, he's, he's crept back home and gone to bed and in the morning. The word of the Lord came to me in verse 8. And this is the interpretation. And... Um, there's one key element that's given in the interpretation, and we haven't heard anything about this before. The people in Jerusalem are going to be exiled, including the king. It was to be so, so radical, this exile. Even the king would be exiled. And this is the promise for the future. This is Zedekiah, the last king of, of Judah. This oracle concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel in it. So even the king is going to be deported, Zedekiah. And this is a sign. Verse 11, say, I am a sign for you. As I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall go into exile, into captivity. And so it's the people still back in Jerusalem who were going to be exiled, actually in 597. And it's coming back to the prince again, uh, including him. He's going to be carrying his sack and off he's, he, he's going to go. And then we've got a moot point in the middle of verse 11. The new RSV says, He shall dig through the wall and carry it through. He shall cover his face so that he may not see the land with his eyes. Now, it's that word, he. And there's a bit of uncertainty because in the margin of the new RSV, at the bottom, it says uh, that two of the ancient versions, there's good witnesses to that he, but the Hebrew text actually says they, they, not a reference to Zedekiah, but a reference to the exiles generally. And that Hebrew reading is kept in the NIV, and I think with, with good justification, that now we, we've moved on to speak generally of the uh, exiles. No, it's not speaking of the exiles. This is the thing. What's this digging through the wall, this digging through the wall? It must refer to the Babylonian army who were besieging Jerusalem. And they, they managed to bash down that wall surrounding Jerusalem and to get through. And so it's that final blow in the siege of Jerusalem where Jerusalem has to fall. And so it's the work of these, 
these Babylonian soldiers who've been besieging Jerusalem for, what, say, 18 months, but now at last they can bash through that wall and get through and uh, get the gates open and get all their, their army in. And so that, that seems to be what's uh, happening there. And then in verse 13, I will spread my net over the king and he shall be caught in my snare. Well, actually, Jeremiah, according to uh, uh, Second Kings, uh, Jeremiah, as the, the, the Babylonians were coming through on the north side of the city, he crept out with his entourage through a gate in the south side of the city and made his way to the uh, Jordan, trying to get over to the Jordan to uh, uh, safety. But, but he, he was spotted, or else a spy, uh, told the Babylonian troops and the army came after him and caught him, and caught him in their snare, as if they were hunters. Well, that's what King says, and that, that's the human situation. But here, it's God doing it. I will spread my net over him. He should be caught in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon. I will scatter every, to every wind all who are around him, his helpers and all his troops, and I will unsheath the sword behind them. Because God is the agent. God is the real agent behind these Babylonian troops, and this is his work, really. And so that's the emphasis there. And then they shall know that I am the Lord. They'll realize at last, wake up. At last their eyes will see and their ears will, will, will hear. And probably it's only that rude awakening taking place when it actually happens. Then they will know. But 17, I will let a few of them escape from the sword, from famine and pestilence. Remember that trio that we've had before? Here it comes again associated with 587, these uh, uh, material agents of God, sword, famine, and pestilence, so that they may tell of all their abominations among the nations where they go. Then they shall know that I am, I am the Lord. And the exiles will come, and they will realize it's been justified. They will realize it's the punishment from God, and they will speak of all the accusations that they deserve. And those abominations, religious sins, moral sins, social sins, that brought them to this sad state. Then, in verse uh, 17, we come to the second symbolic action. And it's associated with the siege of Jerusalem. Uh, just as the, the the first one was. That was the ending of the siege. But here this seems to be during the siege. And people are, are, are besieged and they, they've got enough to eat and are sitting down for their next meal. But they're seized with fear. And they know in their hearts that the end is going to come and eventually those Babylonian troops outside the walls are going to break through. And so they're, they're worried even as they eat their meal. And Ezekiel is to invite people into his home, and he's to be sitting at his table, and he's to be eating his food, but his hand is going to be trembling like that. And he's, he's going to pick up his drink, and he's going to spill it, and it can't reach his mouth. And he's, he's going to be so scared. And this is the a picture of the anxiety that's going to grip the people who are in Jerusalem, knowing what their fate is going to be sooner or later. There for the chop, and they will be caught, and Jerusalem will fall, and they will go into exile. And so this is a very vivid way, this sort of physical way of representing this psychological fear that must be gripping the uh, exiles as they, the next batch of exiles as they await their uh, destruction and deportation. In verse 20, well, if you look at verse 16, we had that recognition form at the end, they shall know, those are the coming exiles, they shall know that I am the Lord. But in verse 21, 
No, in verse 20 at the end, and you shall know that I am in, in the, I am the, the Lord. And at, at this point, this is speaking of the 597 prisoners of war who were grouped around Jeremiah, Ezekiel and seeing this second symbolic action that um, when this happens, when, when people come and say how scared we were as we were anticipating the fall of Jerusalem and, and exile, they say, oh, yes. Ezekiel told us about that, and then they realize, and the experience that they're told will actually convince them at long last that Ezekiel had been right, and they'd been wrong in their false hopes of going back to the promised land pretty soon. When we were going through the first part of the book, we found that um, visions and symbolic actions were followed by messages. And so it is in the second half of the book. And we come in verse 21 uh, to the first of these, a series of messages that we shall be reading uh, throughout this, uh, this second part. And uh, in, in fact, uh, up to uh, chapter 19, uh, a, a lot of messages as the, the third element of this, uh, this major division of the book. And so here we are in verse 21, and it's got his own introductory formula of the reception of the message, the word of the Lord came to me. And it says, Mortal, what is this proverb of yours about the land of Israel? which says the days are prolonged and every vision comes to nothing. I've said before there's an ambiguity when you have second-person pronouns and really you need to check up with the Hebrew text or somebody who knows it. That word yours, what is this proverb of yours? It's not addressed to, to Ezekiel. It's not singular. It's plural. And so it's speaking about the prisoners of war and their general reaction. It's speaking to the general community of uh, exiles, and uh, and what what they were saying uh, was uh, uh, casting doubt upon uh, Ezekiel's prophesying, and so here is God sort of backing up his his prophet in in fact at this point, and they're saying, well, you you keep on telling us about this. Uh, coming destruction of Jerusalem and this exile of uh, another batch from uh, Judah. But it hasn't happened yet, has it? And we don't think it's going to happen. We don't, because days are going by and it hasn't happened yet. So when's it going to happen, Ezekiel? Don't think it will. Don't think it will. And, uh, and so Ezekiel is just told them, is just told in God's name to contradict them and say that's not true. That's not true. Uh, tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God. There's that messenger formula. He's speaking as God's messenger. I will put an end to this proverb, and they shall use it no more as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are near, and the fulfillment of every vision. There shall no longer be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. Now that mention of other visions and other prophecies. This is looking forward, in fact, to chapter 13, because we're going to have a series of messages that are all about prophecy. And in fact, this is about prophecy. Uh, 1221 following is about prophecy. And this is the first message about prophecy. But the later ones are going to be concerned with false prophets. And there was always the embarrassment that classical prophets had that... Uh, Alongside them were other prophets who had quite a different message, and Ezekiel had to face that, as Jeremiah did and Isaiah did. But the days are near, and the fulfillment of every vision. And so there's this strong language, 25, I, the Lord, will speak the word that I speak, and it shall be fulfilled. It will no longer be delayed. In your days, rebellious house, I will speak the word and fulfill it, says the Lord. So in God's name, a contradiction. It's going to happen. 
And then they, they changed their tune a bit, just a bit. They said, well, you've got a point, Ezekiel, uh, that um, your, your accusations, and we suspect that, 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 that you're right, and that there's a lot wrong with Jerusalem and, and with Judah, and we and they deserve, do deserve punishment. But we don't think it's going to happen for quite a while. Uh, God's going to take his time over it, and perhaps he'll give us another chance and so on. So we don't accept that um, uh, it's going to happen any time soon. And so this is the next uh, criticism that comes from the people. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me, and the criticism of the people is radiated through God's message. We're not told that Ezekiel hears the exile say, saying this, but God tells him what the exiles are saying. This is part of that radical theocentricity, that it's all God-centered, and God reveals what they're saying here. And so the house of Israel is saying the vision that he sees is for many years ahead. He prophesies for distant times. We can forget about it now. <laughs> Like somebody who's a heavy smoker and he's told, oh, you'll die of cancer. Ah, it'll be many years' time yet. I've got many years yet to live and I'll keep on smoking my cigarettes. And uh, there's this uh, delay putting things off. And, um, and so there's just a reaffirmation. None of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be fulfilled, says the Lord God. And uh, they, they, they had to, all had to wait till 587, but eventually it, it did come true. And so uh, Ezekiel had to deal with, with opposition from the public uh, as he gave this, this messages from the exiles in, in general. But he had also to face opposition from other prophets. And that uh, letter that, that, that Jeremiah sent and the narrative that goes with it it implies that, um, that there were other prophets who, uh, who were saying that um, the exile wouldn't last long and we'll soon be, be going home. And Jeremiah has to nip that in the bud and say, ha, 70 long years, uh, three generations, a long time yet. Anyway, uh, there were these prophets that Ezekiel met, prophets of Israel, prophets of Israel, 13 and verse 2, mortal Prophesy against the prophets of Israel. They're accepted as genuine prophets by the exilic community. And they're prophesying. Say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Well, no, that thus says the Lord God is, is in fact the beginning of this message to Ezekiel. But this hear the word of the Lord is the very thing that the false prophets were saying and that was the, one of the formulas that Ezekiel would use and the genuine prophets would use. And so there's this ambiguity. And so it's pretty obvious they speak with great sincerity and with great conviction and they believe what they're saying. But God's indictment is, and the reality is, they prophesy out of their own imagination. Uh, they, they don't realize it, but they're making this up, in fact, and putting it forth as the truth, believing it is the truth, but it isn't really. You're the one who gives the truth. And so in verse 3, thus says the Lord God, here's a message for them. Alas for the senseless prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. So there again, it's all in their minds and nothing more than that. Not genuine prophesying at all. And it says in verse 4, your prophets have been like jackals among ruins. And th this is a, a little metaphor that's uh, used here just in, in passing. But it's a contrast of the reality of the situation and somebody trying to make the best of a bad job. They're, they're ruins and they, the, the jackals come nosing around. Is there any food here? Is there any food there? No, the people have gone and the food have gone. And so they're disappointed, disappointed hopes. And so it, it's saying that, um, that they're going to have disappointed hopes, these prophets, like jackals among ruins and trying to find a bit of food there uh, among the devastation, but there's nothing there really. And then 
speaking to those prophets directly in verse 5, you've not gone up into the breaches or repaired a wall for the house of Israel so that it might stand in battle on the day of the Lord. And this is a metaphor that occurs two other times uh, in the Old Testament. And here it applies, it's a metaphor referring to intercession. Remember we said last time, one of the tasks of the prophets was to intercede for the people of of God. They hear this terrible talk of punishment. Give them another chance, God. Oh, no, please spare them a bit longer. And intercession played a part in the work of the classical prophets. But it didn't here. There was no intercession to avert the doom that, that, that was coming. They had no message of doom. They only had a message of peace. They were optimistic prophets. And they said the obligation is on God and God's going to bring peace and he's going to show us his love. In their theology, the obligation rested upon God. There's never any mention of obligation resting on the people of God. And whereas for the prophets generally there was this double obligation and that was what the covenant tradition stood for, the prophets knew nothing about this human obligation. And so... That brand of them is wrong from the start. And here, this word of intercession, going up into the breaches, repairing a wall uh, for the people of God. And there there are um, uh, two passages. One is in Psalm 106 and verse 23, and it's talking about Moses. Moses, after that tragedy of the worship of the golden calf, remember? And uh, God said, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to make a new people out of you, as a sort of new Abraham. And God, Moses intercedes. And the way it's described in Psalm 106 and verse 23 is like this. Therefore he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him. This intermediator this mediator between God and the people, to turn away his wrath from destroying them. And so that that was the message there. And uh, in in, in 34 and verse... uh, No, that's uh, that's going to be another reference. Uh, Okay. We'll, We'll leave it there. And so there, there isn't this intercession between God and, and the people of God saying, please let them off. And instead, they've envisioned falsehood in lying divination. They say, says the Lord, which is often the formula at the end of, uh, of prophetic messages, says the Lord, when the Lord has not sent them, and yet they wait for their fulfillment of their word. It's all in their heads, and they don't know it. They don't know it. They think it's right. But they, they've got to be criticized and have it shown they're wrong. And so, there it is. In verse 8, there's going to be punishment for these prophets. My hand will be against them. Verse 9, they shall not be in the council of my people, nor be enrolled in the register of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter the land of Israel. They're never going to go back. And... uh, In fact, they're going to be excommunicated from the people of God and they won't live to go back, in fact. It's strange, isn't it? It's suddenly we've got mention of these, um, of return to the land. We never do in the pre-587 messages, it's just not complicated. It's just not contemplated. And there's just mention of, of the end, and th- this is the end, you, you, you leave the land, you go to exile, period. That's that. And so there seems to be an, an indication here about not entering the land of Israel that only comes into uh, Ezekiel's uh, uh, messages after 587. And so one has the impression that this particular message in, in 13, in the first part of chapter 13, 
It belongs to the later messages uh, after the fall of Jerusalem. And uh, in fact, this whole section of uh, prophecy, wrong prophecy, it, it's, it's thematic. And so you, you, you have pre-587 messages and post-587 messages uh, uh, mixed in here. And uh, there, are these, uh, there are these clues. Another clue is that um, all the way through, reading through, there's a, a mention of my people, my people. And uh, this again is only something that uh, Ezekiel says after 587. But all the way through, it's my people. The prophets are the enemies of my real people. They're misleading them. And so my people, in verse 9, my people, in, in verse 10, on you go. And then in the next oracle, my people, in verse 18, my people, in verse 19, twice there, my people, in, in verse 21, my people in verse 23. And so this is an indication, too, that uh, of God's loving concern. This is a, a people that he is going to bring back to the land, and these false prophets are going to be excluded. And so this is post-587, and these false prophets are abounding, saying peace when there's no peace in verse 10. They're shalom, what we call shalom prophets. The word for peace is shalom. And uh, Jeremiah had to encounter those too. Shalom prophets, optimistic prophets, who spoke always of obligation on God's side and never of obligation on the part of the people of God, in this case, these these prophets. But then you have another metaphor, uh, quite a developed metaphor, in verse 10 onwards, about a wall. And this is a stone wall in the metaphor. And it's been roughly built with, with no mortar. And um, it looks fine because some white plaster, thick white plaster has been put all over it. And you think, there's a good solid wall. But then the storms come and the winds come and down falls the wall. And there we are. It's exposed for what it is. And uh, that's the attitude of these false prophets. And they talk of peace, and they're talking about a, a wall that isn't solid, a wall that's, that, that, that's, that, that's quite capable of, of, of being destroyed very easily. And bec- they smear the whitewash on it, just smearing the whitewash, this white plaster. But it's not really solid and I'm going to break down the, that, that wall. And those false prophets will perish like the wall in verse 14. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. And so the wall is no more, nor those who smeared it in verse 15. The prophets of Israel who prophesied concerning Jerusalem and saw visions of peace for it when there was no peace for it. Well, that was against male prophets, uh, that um, first oracle in, in 13. and But the second oracle against, is against female prophets. Uh, and so there's a distinction of, of, of gender here. And in verse 17, uh, there are these, uh, these women who are prophesying. But they don't prophesy in, in public. They, they use their prophesying in, in private. And they have clients come to their homes and they charge a fee. They charge a big fee. And um, really, they're, they're, they're not um, ordinary prophets. They, they are, um, they are uh, sort of psychic. And they, are, um, they cast spells and uh, do all sorts of weird and, and wonderful things. And, uh, but they again, the daughters of your people in verse 17, they are, uh, prophesy out of their own imagination. And one thing they did in verse 18, one linked with their spells that they were casting for their clients, they sew bands on all wrists and make veils for the heads of persons of every height, different size of veils to fit the head. And uh, 
we're not told w- w- how this worked, but this is one. This was part of their spells that they would cast, and they're, they're called hunters because they, they would, if you w- went to these uh, women and said you didn't like somebody, well, for a fee, these women would curse the people you didn't like. And so they were like hunters, hunting for human lives. Uh, Will you hunt down lives among my people and maintain your own lives? And uh, there it was. They were uh, doing it for for money and doing it for, for food. Verse 19, you profane me among my people. They were speaking in God's name like the other prophets. You profaned me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, putting to death persons who should not die and keeping alive persons who should not live by your lies to my people who listen to lies. So there were these magic spells and there were blessings and there were curses, but they were all wrong and they didn't relate to the lives of the people at all and they were very, could be very effective and people would die well, they were the wrong people dying, and people would be blessed, and they should have been cursed. That was the way that their lives pointed. And uh, so they too, they too are going to be uh, dealt with by God. Verse 23, I will save my people from your hand. Verses 11, 1 to 11 of chapter 14 is the closing section. And here once again, it's like chapter 8, elders of Israel came to me and sat down before me. And these are some of the five, nine, seven exiles who have a position of responsibility in that labor camp. And uh, they want God to give them a favorable prophecy. Uh, But there's a flaw. There's a flaw. Because they're two-minded people, and they hedge their bets, and God knows it. And they also practice um, the worship of Babylonian gods. And so they're, they're good Yahweh, so they worship Yahweh, and they pray to Yahweh, and they listen to Ezekiel. But on the other hand, they hedge their bets, and they have this two-mindedness in their hearts. And so uh, although they come as people who are honoring God, Uh, They're trying to serve two masters, and that isn't going to work, as as we know. And so uh, God can see into their hearts, and he is uh, denouncing them. These men have taken their idols into their hearts, and um, yet they come to the prophet wanting a favorable message from God. Well, that's not going to happen. And there's this call for repentance, in fact. Uh, Verse 6, thus says the Lord of God, repent and turn away from your idols, turn away your faces from your abominations, be single-minded in your faith and worship only me. This is the message there. And uh, God has no word uh, otherwise. But then in verse 9, we, we, we have a, 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 a prophecy uh, from a, 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 a prophet There's envisioning a, a situation of these men going to a prophet. And he says, well, yeah, well, they are Yahweh's. I, I, th- I think I can ask God to give a message for them. And the, the, the prophet doesn't take into account uh, that they, they have uh, two sides to their religious life. And so there's, there's blame put on those prophets in, in, in verse 9. And, and so there's this uh, repudiation of these uh, of the, of, um, the prophet acting improperly and also worshippers who come to Ezekiel and there's this, uh, this other side to their lives that um, Ezekiel doesn't know about but God certainly does. If you notice, at the end of verse 11, then they shall be my people. If the house of Israel is spared such prophets as these and such two-minded people as these, then 
the house of Israel may no longer go astray from me, nor defile themselves any more with their transgressions. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And so this too seems to be post 587, because that covenant promise is one, for instance, that we've got uh, in Ezekiel 37 and verse uh, 23. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God, definitely in a post-587 message. And so we've moved on, and we're in the context of the more general group of exiles after 587. And we've got this thematic link, a group of collection of messages about prophets and prophecy, but some of them are pre-587, and some of them are are post-587. And so... Overall, there's this uh, question of prophecy and the need to discern, and the people need to discern, between good and true prophets. And um, so much space is given to putting together this issue of prophecy. And the claims are being made, and some are right and some are wrong, but there must be that discernment. And Ezekiel has to, uh, has to uh, be a part as a true prophet and criticizing these false prophets. Next time, our section will be 1412 down to the end of chapter 16. This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the book of Ezekiel. This is session number six, Signs About Exile from Jerusalem, Message About Prophecy Pre-Fall and Post-Fall. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 1 through chapter 14, verse 11.